we're live. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Juan. And uh, welcome, everyone, to this, uh, this webinar. Um, the International Drug Policy Consortium uh, does one of these each year now before the, the big Commission on Narcotic Drugs meeting, which happens every March. Um, and it really is just an opportunity to kind of explain a bit about the meeting, uh, talk about some of the um, talk about some of the strategies and some of the key issues that are going to come up. Plus, uh, I'm really pleased today we're going to hear from um, two IDPC members, Nasli in Canada and Olga in um, the Eurasia region. Um, they're going to tell us a bit about their own work and experiences around CND. Um, and as we go, there's an opportunity for anyone um, listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube. Uh, you have the opportunity to submit any questions you may have. Um, there should be a, a kind of chat section to the right hand side. So please, uh, please do let us know if anything's unclear or if there's uh, anything else you'd like us to answer. So um, without further ado, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Jamie Bridge. I am the Chief Operating Officer here at IDPC. We're based, uh, based in London, but we also have offices in, um, in Bangkok, in Thailand, and we are a global network of 180 NGOs um, from all around the world, uh, a real range of different organizations. Um, and we come together to collectively promote drug policies that are based on human rights, on health, development, social inclusion, all the good stuff. Um, and really our role as a, as a global network is to help facilitate uh, civil society and NGOs to participate in the drug policy debates that are happening at the global level. So, you know, this webinar is just one part of that. We also have a whole range of publications and other resources. Um, and this is one of them. This is a video in case you haven't already uh, seen this on YouTube. Um, please do visit the link. Uh, this is our CND 101 video. So this will give you um, a kind of a real introductory guide about what CND is, what it does, why it exists, um, and uh, and what it looks like. Um, so I'd really recommend, particularly if you're if you're planning to be uh, in Vienna for the first time uh, later this month, um, I would certainly recommend uh, watching this video just to give you that background information um, about the uh, about the whole meeting. And um, just one thing to add at this juncture, and it's covered in in the CND 101 video. Um, you do require a pass to attend the CND. So if you are planning to attend the meeting um, this month in Vienna, please do make sure that you have a ECOSOC pass. They call it an ECOSOC pass, but please make sure that you have a, an official pass. If you are in doubt or if you do not have a pass, please contact IDPC and uh, we will do our best to, um, to help you out. So, uh, in this webinar, as I said, we're going to hear from um, from Nasli and Olga, and um, I'll hand over to them just after I've done a few introductory slides. But we're really we're going to talk about some of the key issues that are going to arise this year. Um, and this year, the CND is split into two sections. You have a two-day ministerial segment, and and then a five-day kind of regular session. I'll talk. I'll explain that a bit more later. Um, we're going to hear, as I say, from the field and then uh, talk about some of the key resources, uh, key places to look for information and answer any questions that you guys may have. So the ministerial segment, um, this is the first two days. So we're talking about Thursday, the 14th of March and Friday, the 15th of March. Um, the ministerial segment um, exists because in 2009, the member states agreed a political declaration on drugs and a plan of action on drugs. And this is a 10 year plan of action. Um, and in that document, they stated that uh, 2019 was the target date. It's a 10 year plan. So by 2019, the goal was that they would have eliminated or significantly reduced drug use, drug trafficking, drug supply, drug production and money laundering. Um, it doesn't take a genius to work out that they have not achieved those goals um, unless something spectacular happens in the next week. Uh, they are not going to achieve those goals in time for the CND. So they're holding this ministerial segment as a way it, it, it has two functions, really. One is to look back on the last decade 
and to reflect on the progress that has been made or more importantly to reflect on where progress hasn't been made um, and the second part of uh, the focus is to look forward and to agree what happens next what does the next 10 years what does the next decade look like and and what is the, the kind of plan for that 10 years um, the meeting the ministerial segment will be chaired by Sudan um, the, the the countries that are members of CND they they rotate between regional groups to decide who will chair um, and this year it is the turn of the Africa group so Sudan will be chairing and they are being uh, supported and facilitated by Nigeria in that role so if we move on to the program for the ministerial segment, as I say, this is on the 14th and the 15th of, um, uh, of March. There's an opening session to kick things off, um, and that will be the, the dignitaries, the, the executive director of the UNODC, etc., cetera, um, giving their opening statements. And then for, throughout the two days, we will have uh, what they call a general debate. Um, Debate is perhaps the wrong word here, because actually what it is, is a series of country statements read out by the ministers and by the other um, participants, um, really kind of just laying out their country's position. There isn't really much debate, as in there's, there isn't really much interaction between countries and you don't tend to get someone questioning someone else's statement. Um, but that's the, the main the main uh, agenda item will be this general debate. So every country will be talking about what they've done for the last 10 years and, and hopefully talking about what they plan to do for the next 10 years. Now, in parallel to that, in, a, in another big room just around the corner, there will be two roundtable discussions. Um, the first one on the 14th of March will take stock of the last 10 years. We've used a shorthand here for the names of these roundtables because each one is about five sentences long. Um, so the 14th of March looks backwards and takes stock of the last 10 years. And the 15th of March will be looking forward and is talking about, they call it safeguarding the future, but it's really talking about what's going to happen for the next 10 years. Now, crucially, in terms of civil society participation, um, as with all CND meetings, civil society can ask to speak in the general debate. We are allowed to make uh, statements, provided we are ECOSOC registered. So as, as long as we are registered with the United Nations, um, we can apply to speak. However, we've been advised, because civil society always has to speak, in a general debate, we speak at the end. So countries go first, then the regional groups, and then the UN agencies then the other international organizations like the Red Cross and, and things like this, and then civil society. And it is possible that they will run out of time because we expect that almost every country is going to want to make a statement because this is a high level meeting. Some countries will even have their head of state in the room. So some countries are taking this very seriously. Um, it, there is a risk that we will run out of time and that uh, all the civil society organizations that want to speak may not get a chance. So I think that's really important just to be prepared for that. Um, if you do not get to speak at the ministerial segment, there will be plenty of opportunities to speak during the following week and I'll come on to that later. For the round tables, um, there will be one civil society panelist on each round table. Um, that those people have been selected uh, by the civil society task force. There was an open call for speakers um, and they have selected uh, panelists. And again, um, they're worried that they're going to run out of time. These are only three hour, um, three hour sessions. Um, so in the interest of time, the civil society task force has also nominated two other civil society speakers who we hope will be able to intervene from the floor. Um, the ultimate outcome of this ministerial segment um, will be the adoption of a new political declaration which guides the international drug control work for the next 10 years. We understand that they will actually, they hope to adopt that ministerial segment right at the beginning of the day. Um, which is actually what they did for the UNGAS in 2016 as well. They adopted the outcome right at the start. 
Um, and possibly one of the reasons for that is because they've been debate, they've been negotiating this document now for for uh, several several months. Um, they don't want to have to renegotiate it during the ministerial segment. Um, if we just flick to the next slide. So as well as the general debates and the roundtable sessions, there will also be side events during the high level meeting. Um, the, but only what they're calling high level events, which means that you were only provided with a side event slot if you have a, a minister or a similar high level speaker as part of your plans. Um, so these are high level events. There's going to be 12 of them in total. Um, they're going to run for slightly longer than normal. I think they're 90 minute sessions. Um, so you'll have six on the 14th and six on the 15th. And the link that is available here. Um, if you want to have a look at the topics and you know who is organizing those side events. And as I say, um, next slide, as I say, the, ne the, the main outcome, the main uh, product of this meeting will be the ministerial declaration. Um, they are currently negotiating this. In fact, I think they're even locked in negotiations as we speak right now. Um, and they have been negotiating this for several, several months now. Um, their hope was to have it finalized by today, um, but uh, that's probably a bit ambitious. But they are definitely aiming to have the document agreed by consensus before the ministerials, uh, before the ministerial segment starts. The document has three sections, an introductory section, uh, a section that, that attempts to take stock of the last 10 years, and then a section that looks forward to the next 10 years and Kind of outlines some of the key uh, actions or, or operative paragraphs, as we call it, um, the key actions for for the international community to take over the next decade. Um, it is not a technical document, so it doesn't go into the same amount of detail as the UNGAS outcome document, which uh, I think was something like forty odd pages in the end. This document is a political one, so it's shorter. It, it really is it's focusing more on kind of the headline messages rather than getting into the the real you know the real detail about naloxone programs and different kinds of drug treatment and all these kind of things it, it's um it's a much more kind of it's much more about the political intentions um but even then um it is uh, there's still several areas in this document where member states are struggling to find a consensus um in vienna uh, all decisions um, on documents like this are made by consensus, um, and they're very proud of that fact. Um, but there are a number of areas where they are currently uh, finding it quite difficult to find that middle ground or to find that compromise. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, one of the, the 2009 political declaration uh, set a 10-year target to eradicate drugs. Um, and there is now a, a kind of debate between member states about well what do we do now do we extend that target and say that we'll eradicate drugs by 2029 um you know i think everyone in in vienna understands that that's completely uh, unrealistic but they also at the same time want to have some kind of target or some kind of goal um to to kind of help to mobilize political support for the next 10 years um, there's debate about how strongly mentioned human rights should be and also how strongly mentioned the uh, sustainable development goals should be. Um, obviously, you know, all drug policies should be in line with human rights and all drug policies should be in line with the SDGs. But exactly how they frame that in the document is currently causing um, some disagreement. Um, and similarly around, um, you know, how to reach out to other UN agencies, so not just those based in Vienna, but how do you work more closely with UNAID, WHO, OHCHR, all the different areas of the UN. And, um, and civil society, obviously, at the moment, we are mentioned in the document, uh, specifically mentioned, which is great. Um, and at the moment, I understand there is a commitment to carry on working with civil society. So we really hope that that will stay in the document, um, uh, you know, uh, by the time that it's agreed um, later this month. Um, 
you know, now, because these negotiations are going on now and they're, they're almost at a, uh, kind of like the final stages of negotiation now, um, you know, now is a great time to be talking with your own government and talking about their kind of red lines, as we say, you know, like what are their positions on this document? What is it that they're fighting for? What is it that they're trying to hold on to? Or what is it that they're trying to resist? Now is a great time to, to be having that conversation. So that's the first two days, the 14th and the 15th. Um, then after a lovely weekend in sunny Vienna, um, we then have the regular CND. This is the business as usual CND. This will be from Monday the 18th through to Friday the 22nd of March. Um, and it's at this meeting where the usual CND business will take place uh, for anyone, any of you that have been before. And again, the chair will be Sudan and the vice chair will be Iran this time round. So the program, um, again, this is regular CND business. So they will be discussing some of the budgetary issues for UNODC. They will have a session on implementing treaties and particularly uh, they will be voting on a number of substances that WHO has recommended either to, to add to the list of prohibited substances or to change their status or to keep them off. So um, WHO made those recommendations in December and the, the countries of the CND will make their decision based on that recommendation. Um, crucially, they will not be voting on cannabis. Um, there was a WHO recommendation to, to change how cannabis is listed in the international schedules. Um, but the member states have said they need more time to consider this and it's likely that that vote now won't happen until either later this year or maybe even March next year. So cannabis will not be voted on specifically um, in this week in Vienna. Uh, other issues uh, about implementat implementation of the 2009 declaration following up to the 2016 UNGAS. Um, and then if we click the next slide, um, it just, there's going to be discussion about interagency cooperation, how to work together across the UN, um, how CND contributes to the Sustainable Development Goals, um, and then some other small items of business as they plan for the rest of the year. Um, so as I say, that's the, the plenary set, that's the main session, and it's business as usual. Um, around the corner in another room, which is called the Committee of the Whole, um, they will be negotiating a series of resolutions. Now, this year, there's actually fewer resolutions than normal, mainly because most governments are, have been kind of distracted or occupied with the ministerial declaration negotiations. But in this room, as you can see on the picture, um, they will be negotiating it. This is where actual debate does happen, because if you can see on the picture, what you have there on the screen is you have the resolution that they're talking about, it's put up on the screen as a Word document and all the governments, each government has a seat in the room. Each government then takes it in turns to put their flag up and say, right, on line seven, I'd like to change this to this. You know, it's, it's where you really get to see um, the, the negotiations taking place in real time. Um, so the eight resolutions this year are... Uh, we have one on... Um, precursors uh, and kind of greater controls over precursors that's been submitted by Turkey. We've got one on uh, expanding the role of the INCB that's been submitted by Russia. Um, and the backdrop to this is, is Russia have been very critical of Canada in particular because Canada has now announced that it will have a regulated cannabis market, which is something that the treaty do not allow you to have. And Canada has been very open by, about saying that, yes, we are going to do this. We're going to have a regulated cannabis market and it breaches the drug control treaties. Um, their argument is that it protects young people, it protects health and it will protect human rights. But they are open about the fact that it's, it's in violation of the treaties. So that's why this resolution is on the table. It doesn't obviously mention Canada specifically. It, it wouldn't be allowed to. But it does mention cannabis specifically at the moment, and it really tries to expand and, and strengthen the role of INCB to act as the kind of enforcer of, of the drug control treaties. The L4 um, 
the uh, fourth resolution, uh, sorry, third resolution on the list there is around hepatitis C. This is one that we are um, trying to support as much as we can. It's been submitted by Norway um, and uh, it's a positive harm reduction focus uh, resolution, which we hope will, will um, survive the negotiations. Um, there's been a resolution on uh, forensic detection of synthetic drugs. Um, I'm not quite sure who that's from. And then the next slide. Um, we then have resolutions on alternative development uh, by Germany, Thailand, and Peru. These three countries have been submitting a resolution on this issue almost every year now for several years. So it's part of a series of different uh, documents. Um, there's one on uh, synthetic drugs, in particular the opiate crisis in North America. That's been submitted by Canada and the USA. Uh, we haven't seen the text of that, but I think with that one it's important that it doesn't just focus on kind of a law enforcement and control response, but that it also does uh, focus on um, the health response as well, naloxone, drug consumption, things like this. Um, and then the last two um, uh, are around, again, controlled substances and the availability of, of medicines and controlled medicines, and that's from El Salvador. We haven't seen the text, but we, we are pleased that that issue is on the table. Um, and then uh, the last one is from Brazil, and it's around improving access to post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP, uh, as a HIV prevention uh, tool for women who use drugs. And again, we haven't seen the text of that one, but it's again positive that this issue is being discussed at the CND. So they're the resolutions that will be discussed. And then as with the high level segment, there will be side events. Um, and this time over, the, over four days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there's gonna be 90 side events taking place. And they cover a huge range of different uh, topics. Um, and I think many IDPC members and partners are going to be involved either presenting or organizing or something like this. So um, we're waiting for the final side event uh, program to be released. Um, please do keep checking the IDPC website and the CND website for that. Um, but yes, lots of side events, lots of things to attend. In addition to those, um, the Vienna NGO Committee, which is a, an, an independent committee which I'm actually the chair of, um, we have organized a, a series of NGO dialogues, so an opportunity really for a question and answer session with uh, the executive director of UNODC, Mr. Yuri Fedotov, um, the president of the INCB, and the chair of the CND, which, if you remember this time around, is uh, the ambassador from Sudan. Um, so two of those had been, had been arranged for Wednesday the 20th. Um, the third one, we're still waiting to find out the availability of the ambassador. And then in addition, the VNGOC will also have its general assembly, um, and that will include uh, elections for uh, the chair position, um, as well as for deputy treasurer and deputy secretary. So that will be on the Tuesday in the afternoon. I think it starts at four o'clock on Tuesday the 19th. Um, okay, so that's a, a real kind of whirlwind um, introduction to the CND. But now um, I'd like to hand over to Nasli, who's going to uh, talk us through her, um, yeah, her take on it and the work that she has been doing at CND over the last few years. So Nasli, happy to hand over to you. Thank you. Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and thanks to IDPC for inviting me to participate in this webinar. So as mentioned, my name is Nazli Maksudi. I'm actually the Knowledge Translation Manager at the Center on Drug Policy Evaluation in Canada, Toronto specifically. You may know us by our former name, which is the International Center for Science in Drug Policy, or the ICSDP. And while we have rebranded, our mission really remains the same, which is to support the development of evidence-based drug policies at the local, national, and international levels, particularly through conducting research and outreach, including with policymakers. So today, I'm going to focus my remarks on my experiences at the CND, as well as specifically how my relationship, as well as my colleagues' relationship with the Canadian government has evolved over the last several years and been strengthened by our CND engagement. 
So I have been actually attending CND. This will be my sixth CND, if I can believe it. So I've been attending since 2014. And for the most part, I've really been attending on behalf of civil society, beginning first as chair of the board of directors of Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy, and then in my role at CDPE, which I mentioned. However, I had the unique opportunity last year to actually attend CND as a member of the Canadian government delegation, which is something that I'll speak to specifically in my remarks today. Next slide, please. So I wanted to spend some time discussing the evolution in our engagement with the Canadian government since I have been attending the CND and been involved in this work. So as you may imagine, in 2014 and 2015, under the Conservative government, we really had quite limited engagement when it came to the CND and meeting with the Canadian government. We really only had one or two meetings per CND, nothing before, nothing after. And of course, that was not for lack of trying. I would pinpoint it on the political environment at the time. However, in 2015, late 2015, when the Liberal government was elected, myself and other Canadian civil society colleagues working on international drug policy issues really seized the opportunity for increased engagement. And the Canadian government was quite receptive early on and included civil society on their UNGAS delegation in 2016. And that included representatives from youth, civil society, people with lived experience, as well as Indigenous voices. And since then, our engagement has really continued to grow. Particularly in 2018, we were tasked with assigning someone to fill a role that had been given to us by the Canadian delegation on their, by the Canadian government on their CND delegation, which was titled the Civil Society Representative. And the Canadian civil society organizations working on this issue and partnering with government were tasked with deciding who would fill this role. So we produced a democratic process whereby folks nominated themselves to fill this role, and then all the civil society organizations involved were able to vote and I was actually unanimously elected to fill this role of civil society representative, which I should say is really a role that comes down to a formalization of a point person for communicating and bridging knowledge gaps between government and civil society. And this was a role that occurred before CND, so preparations for CND, during CND itself, and even after the CND. So since last year, this position has actually continued to evolve into a year-round position. And this year's Canadian delegation will include that person that's acting in this role year-round, but also will have six other civil society representatives. So at the upcoming high-level ministerial segment in CND, there will be seven civil society representatives on the Canadian delegation, which certainly is a record for Canada. I'm not sure if it's a record amongst other member states, but certainly it's in the top percentile of civil society representation within official government delegations at CND. If you could click ahead, Juan, that would be great. Thank you. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time just sharing some strategies that I have found to be effective for building and strengthening relationships with our government colleagues. And this really goes beyond having regular meetings and communications. And it'll apply both to your national government, but also potentially to other member states as well, if you're interested in engaging with governments from elsewhere on international drug policy issues. And I'll note as well, some of these tips are likely going to be more relevant in a context where your government that you're engaging with is actually both receptive to civil society engagement first and foremost, but also is perhaps amenable to your position on drug policy approaches, or at least willing to listen to your position on drug policy approaches. So the first tip that I would give is really to work as hard as you can to tailor and make sure that the information you're providing to your government colleagues and member states is as relevant as it can be for them. And an example I'll give is last year, Canada put forward the first resolution on stigma at the CND and negotiations were quite difficult around that. So myself and other Canadian civil society colleagues were able to support our member state by sharing previously agreed language that was relevant and could be applied to the stigma resolution and we did that through the book of ebook of authorities actually which is an idpc resource and was immensely helpful other cnd resources that have been given to our canadian government colleagues and they've been highly appreciative of is the cnd the live blog cnd blog because of course you cannot be in all places at once at the cnd so it's likely that folks will miss things and that's a great way to see what you perhaps missed and the CND app is also a really crucial resource that our government is using. Particularly, many aspects of it are great, but one of the best aspects of it, in my opinion, 
is it's live tracking of what's going on in the Committee of the Whole, where the resolutions are negotiated. And when you're running around the Vienna International Center and not necessarily aware of what's happening minute by minute in that room, it's quite useful to have the app. And if the resolution you're interested in is being discussed, you can be notified and enter the room. So that was really useful for our government delegation, as well as myself and civil society colleagues who use that app. So a second tip I'll give is about inviting governments to co-sponsor side events with you and even deliver remarks at side events. So although it's late for this year, unless you already have a side event that's been approved, this is really something that you could perhaps consider for next year. I found it really immensely helpful to partner with government in co-sponsoring side events, not just in strengthening relationships, but also in increasing the uh, prevalence of folks that are actually attending the event. Putting a name of a member state as a co-sponsor really does kind of up the ante and pull more member states into the room than perhaps you would have otherwise if it was only an NGO event. So it's really a win-win to involve uh, governments in your side events. And the last tip that I'll give is really just about coordinating with other NGOs. And this is part of the idea that we should make sure that we're singing from the same song sheet and incorporating our CND advocacy into larger advocacy around drug policy. And this could be both domestic and internationally. With respect to internationally, we have an incredible coordinating body within International Drug Policy Consortium that helps us to make sure that we're all singing from the same song sheet, if you will. But domestically in Canada, we have also produced what we refer to as a Canadian Civil Society work Working group on UN drug policy. Earlier I mentioned Canadian civil society organizations were voting on who would fill the role of the civil society representative on the delegation last year. So this is exactly that group and it was actually created in advance of the UNGAS and was reconvened for advance of the high level ministerial segment. And in both cases, what we did collaboratively was produce a policy brief with our key recommendations for the Canadian government and for other governments. So if you're interested, you can actually find our policy brief that we produced as part of this working group as a stakeholder contribution on the UN ODC's high level ministerial segment webpage. So I think I'll leave it there for now. And thank you so much. I look forward to questions and comments. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much, Nazali. That was a really, really excellent um, kind of summary. And I think your example is a really good one of how how civil society can really use the CND for your own purposes and uh, to, you know, to advance your own advocacy stuff. So brilliant. Thank you very much, Nazali. Um, OK, we don't have I've been looking at the, uh, the YouTube page. We don't have any specific comments that have not been answered. Um, so uh, I'll hand over now to Olga from the Eurasian Harm Reduction Association. Um, Olga, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ola. I represent the community of people who use drugs and work in the membership-based organization, Eurasian Harm Reduction Association. My history and history of our international consortium started in Moldova two years ago when representatives from the community of people who use drugs discuss how the national laws work in countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. In each country, we selected the most relevant laws which we, with mentoring support, can change in the next two, three years. Jamie explained uh, the um, international drug policy tendencies and how we can be included in all these processes and CND became one of its. Um, we choose such um, task for us. There are laws and policies on takeaway OST in Belarus, changes the articles and new code of misconduct and crime based on community-led monitoring in Kyrgyzstan, implementation of drug checking services and education of parliament members in Lithuania, support the white nose movement in their activities to abolish all punishments for the possession of any drugs in Sakartvela, Georgia. Thank you, John. You know, CND has unwritten rules, <clears throat> no naming, no shaming. We prepare the presentation which is supposed to be present to the target country's delegations, of course. But when I come to the intersessional meeting in autumn last year, all government representatives from the countries I supposed to speak were not there in the CND room. And we made a decision to name each country because it is extremely important for us that other governments with progressive agenda understand what is happening in drug policy in practical level in our region. 
we shouldn't must tell the name of other uh, of the countries otherwise the meaning of the discussion is lost our community empowerment strategy is to invest enough time and resource to create the first connection between community and government leaders by using different tactics it's one way to get access to meet and face-to-face -face meeting with decision makers on national level in particular in countries with totalitarian regime that's why we took part in cnd meetings together with community leaders from russia and belarus to see and get contact with members of the government delegations and use their assertions for advocacy on national level for kyrgyzstan where people twice overthrew the corruption regime for the last 10 years and we have access to decision makers we use the CND floor to show the government that national community leaders are part of the International Expert Consortium and it is us to whom government must report. And also, as Nazi mentioned it, we share online uh, videos of government site event with our community who are not at CND because all drug policy issues must be open for wider discussion with meaningful participation of people who use drugs. This is the basic things what we do during the CND. Thank you. Excellent stuff. Thank you so much, uh, Olga. Um, and again, yeah, I mean, same as Nasli, Olga is someone who has, has been attending CND now for, for you know, a number of years and has really um kind of honed how to use it how to use it for your own advocacy and how to use it as a a kind of moment to to kind of get the message across to the target audience which are ultimately other policy makers um so before we go uh, just a few final things from my side um just to update you on a few key resources so if you are attending the cnd or you're just interested in the cnd uh, here are some of the key links to to kind of um to support you in your work so um, the CND has its official documents website. Um, the UNODC has a guide for civil society and a guide on how to participate. Um, the Vienna NGO Committee has a guide on uh, how to how to use CND and what CND is. And then uh, IDPC also has our own web page as well. So between those four websites and the, those four resources, um, you have everything. Uh, you know, you should have everything you need. Um, if you still have any questions or if you if you want to discuss anything any further, um, the IDPC team is here to help uh, and here to advise in any way that we can. So please don't hesitate to, uh, to get in touch as well. Um, another key resource that we have is uh, the CND app. It's been mentioned already um, by, by Nasli, but the, the app is uh, a relatively new initiative. Um, and um, it's designed, it's available on the Apple and Android stores. Uh, it, it's, it looks beautiful. It has all the program loaded in, so you can kind of plan your own uh, itinerary for the, during the session, your side events and things like this. But also, crucially, it provides two services. Uh, one, it lets you know if you're in the plenary room, it will let you know what's going on in the committee of the whole, where the resolutions are being negotiated and vice versa. So it's a way to keep an eye on a kind of parallel debate that's happening in two different rooms at once, um, which is something that is designed to help all of you as civil society, but also um, to help uh, the actual government representatives, representatives as well. Um, and the other thing that this has is a database of all the agreed language from previous resolutions. Um, so if you want to find out really quickly, have they ever agreed language on stigma, for example, um, you can just type in the word stigma and it will show you exactly what language has been agreed. The reason we do this is because when you're negotiating a new resolution, it's always easier to use language that has already been agreed because it's hard for, a for, for another country to... Um, it's hard for another country to kind of push back against it because you can just say, well, you agreed this language last year, you know? Um, so that's the CND app. Please do download it and, and give us your feedback crucially as well because it's something we try to improve every year. And then other key resources, um, 
we will be sending out daily email updates to everyone who tells us they're at CND. So please email um, Samantha Singh from IDPC. Uh, her email address is here on the slide. Um, and uh, we'll add you to the list. And that means we can just keep you up to date with new developments or, or anything like this. Uh, we have the blog. We'll be operating the blog. So every plenary discussion, every resolution negotiation, every site, well, most of the side events will be documented on the blog. And because there is no kind of central database of statements and there's no, the whole thing is not webcast or recorded, um, that's why the blog is so important. It is one of the only records you can find if you want to find out exactly what it is your country said. So even if you're not in CND, if you, even if you're not in Vienna, um, the blog is there available for you. It's updated as quickly as it possibly can be. And it's your way to find out what are my government saying? What is the statement that my government has made? Um, we also have a, an IDPC meeting on the Saturday. So this is in between the high level segment and the, CN, the main CND. Uh, so that's Saturday the 16th. Um, we will have a orientation meeting. It's particularly aimed at people who are new to CND or um, have maybe only attended uh, a few times. Um, it's on Saturday from 10 till 1. And again, please let Samantha know if uh, you wish to attend. It's on a first come, first serve basis, and places are limited. So that was all for me. I hope that it was uh, useful. I hope that it was clear. Uh, you have all of our contacts here on the slide. Um, and we are monitoring the questions that are, that are asked as well on uh, YouTube. So um, there has been a question for Nasli. Um, it says, the policy brief of the Canadian Working Group, do you have a link to it um, at the ministerial segment page? Uh, Nasli, do you want to reply to this? Sure. I believe someone also responded directly within the comments with the link. I think Richard Elliott did that there. But Oh, excellent. <laughs> I've just seen that. Sorry. Thank you. Thank no you, Richard. problem. Yeah. OK. So um, that will be there. Is that? That chat history, does that stay on there even after the webinar is finished? It does. So that link will be available for anyone, even if you're not watching this live. Um, that link will be there. Um, any other questions? I'm just having a quick check before we finish. Um, OK. Uh, and uh, just to answer Matt's quick question, yes, this will be available um, uh, recorded. So you can come back to this video or share it with other people. Um, it will be available for for all eternity, uh, so you can you can watch it over and over and over again, Matt. Okay, thank you very much, everyone who has uh, watched this live, and anyone who is watching it at any other dates. We very much look forward to seeing you at the CND. Um, please do get in touch if there's anything we can do to help. And uh, yeah, best uh, enjoy your travels to Vienna. Thank you very much, everyone.